So now that the dust has settled from the Ryzen 3000 and RX 5700 series announcements, and after the lukewarm reception that the GPUs in particular got, I thought it would be interesting to compare AMD's approach to GPU design versus Nvidia's. Before that though, a lot of people were left disappointed with the Navi's pricing. In my last video I said that the 5700 was expected to launch at $379, and that's exactly where it landed. However, when I was given that information, information, I didn't realize that that was for the cut-down version and not for the full chip. At $450, I can tell you right now that the 5700 XT will have a hard time selling. The 5700 though, I think will sell well even at $379, although I think $350 would be a more appropriate price. I'll reserve judgment until independent reviews are available. If you think about it, it's in AMD's interest to have the GPUs at these high prices even if they don't sell. Why? Because if gamers aren't buying RTX cards because they are overpriced, and if gamers aren't buying Navi cards either because they're also overpriced, guess where they will be spending their money instead? Either consoles or a cloud gaming service, which is where AMD dominates. The good news for us is that I think it's inevitable for Nvidia to start dropping prices, and AMD will have no choice but to follow suit. I wouldn't be surprised if the 5700 and XT start dropping in price just a few weeks after they come out. At the end of the day, it's all a matter of perspective. If you look at the 5700 as a GPU launch akin to the R9 390, then it's about on par in terms of price to performance. The R9 390 launched at $329, could be overclocked to match the 390X, and competed with Nvidia's 70 series at the time, the GTX 970. The 5700 seems to be positioned similarly. It's launching at $379. It probably can be overclocked to match the XT's performance, or close to it, and it competes with Nvidia's current 70 series, the RTX 2070, assuming it does overclock well. Once you see the 5700 in that light, it actually seems like good value, just like the R9 390 was. If, however, you think of the 5700 as an RX 470 replacement, then things don't look so good. It's way too expensive to represent value like the RX 470 and 480 did. So my early thoughts on the Navi GPUs are that the 5700 is actually a very interesting GPU that will probably be a good buy, even at $379, while the 5700 XT is something that you should probably avoid until it costs around $400. Again, independent reviews might change my mind. Speaking of recommendations, a lot of people have been asking me on Twitter and in the comments section here on YouTube about what CPUs or GPUs I would recommend. So I've been busy in the last couple of weeks putting together a website with my recommendations for hardware, as well as some complete builds. There's also a forum and some resources for our community which you might find useful. You can check it out at cortex.tech. To understand why Nvidia has consistently been pulling away from AMD in terms of performance, and why that might be changing soon, we need to start by looking at how graphics in games are actually generated. During the process of generating graphics in games, data flows from input to output through various programmable stages. Think of it as creating a painting on a canvas, the painter being the graphics artist, the brush being the hardware, and the canvas being the monitor. When creating this painting, there are several steps before getting a final image. You first draw some basic shapes, then you apply the base colors, then do more precise coloring, and then shading, etc. You get the point, until finally you end up with a complete image. Each frame you see on screen, like this one for the venerable Skyrim, is like a painting that underwent several stages. Ideally, you see 60 of these paintings every second, so that gameplay looks smooth. Looking specifically at the graphics pipeline, the first stage in this painting process is the input assembler stage. In this stage, the vertex and primitive data is read from memory, and the primitives are assembled. Primitives can be points, lines, triangles, and quads. By the way, we'll look at how all these stages work on a hardware level in a second. So in this first stage, a bunch of values are generated and are stored in a buffer, which will be accessed later. The second stage is vertex shading. 
where we are going to process the vertices we got from the previous stage. How do we process them? We use the inputs constant data, vertex data and texture data. So shader programs are written to transform a single vertex. A transform can be something like skinning, morphing and per vertex lighting. Now even though the shader only transforms one vertex, the hardware will work on the vertices in a massively parallel system. So basically all that happened in these first two stages was that we calculated the properties and attributes of vertices, like color and the normal vector, and stitched them together into shapes which we call primitives. A triangle is a common primitive that you will see often in games. After this is done, we need to transform the vertices from local space to world space. We use matrices with translation, scale and rotation relative to the world coordinates. So that's your x, y and z axis that you are familiar with. The z axis, by the way, faces away from the viewport, or from the monitor if you will. As you can imagine, all of this involves a ton of math, which is why it's a good thing we have hardware specifically designed to do this. So at this stage, these primitives which form objects are placed in the game world. Most objects that you see in a 3D game are made up of these vertices. So if we turn on wireframe view here in Skyrim, you can see that this rock is made up of a bunch of these vertices connected together to form triangles, which are in turn stitched together to form the rock faces. So we did all of that math previously to determine where in the game world all of these vertices would appear. Making sense so far? So if we take this vertex as an example, it will have a bunch of attributes that were computed for it to be displayed in this exact place in the game world and connected to these other vertices. It has a color and a normal vector which will help with lighting calculations and other attributes. And yes, it also has texture coordinates, although triangles map to textures in 2D space and don't need to have any dependency on world or view transforms. After all the local to world transforms happen, the other two components of this vertex shader stage are establishing the view and the projection. So here in Skyrim, as I'm moving the mouse around, there are transformations happening in the vertices on screen, as well as in the view, to determine where I am in the world space. And there are transformations happening to the projection in order to give the image the illusion of depth so that that giant over there in the background seems like it's far away compared to this rock in the foreground. Obviously, to position the camera, the objects have to be transformed from local to world first. You can't move the camera if the objects haven't been placed in the world yet, if that makes sense. DirectX 10 introduced the ability to program shaders for full primitives, as well as the ability to generate new vertices on output. This would be done in the third stage of the pipeline, which we call geometry shaders stage. What's cool about the geometry shader stage is that new vertices and primitives can be generated on the GPU, so they don't need to be passed from the CPU. That can result, for instance, in cool effects like dynamic particle systems. Once these stages are complete, vertex data goes to on-chip storage. Now why not store this in memory instead? Memory is really slow compared to local storage. One of the things that happens with tessellation in GCN is that after a certain tessellation amount, the new vertices can't fit into on-chip storage, so they are forced to go into memory. And we've seen what happens when this occurs, with some famous examples of tessellation destroying AMD's GPU's performance. So it's crucial that all the vertex data fits into local on-chip storage. The X11 introduced an ordered access view, which allows shaders to write to GPU memory at any stage. This means that once vertex data goes through these previous stages and all the geometry is ready, we can move to the rasterizer stage. This is where vector information is converted into a raster image. In other words, the vertices that go beyond the camera viewport are clipped away and the primitives are converted into pixels. The next stage in the graphics pipeline is the pixel shader stage. So here, each pixel is worked on one at a time, with transformations being applied 
such as texturing, per pixel lighting and post processing. Because some of these processes can hinder performance, many of these transformations can be turned off in the game's graphics settings menu. So when you go into the settings menu and turn off ambient occlusion, for instance, you are telling the game's engine to skip this process in this stage of the graphics pipeline. Another example is AMD's new Fidelity FX post-processing effect called Contrast Adaptive Sharpening, which will also be applied at this stage of the pipeline. Some of the calculations here actually happen in fixed function hardware. So for instance, if we look at the textures going around this wall in Skyrim, there is a specific hardware block that does this work of tiling this texture repeatedly around the surface of the wall. Again, we'll look at the hardware in just a bit. So after all of these transformations to pixels have been executed, we finally get to the final output merger stage, where a final rendered pixel color is generated based on the data calculated in the pipeline up until now. Before the pixel is output to the screen, there's a depth and stencil test and a final color blending. So this is a quick summary of how a bunch of commands sent to the CPU result in the GPU showing a pixel on your screen when you are playing a game. But how does this translate to hardware? And what exactly in this whole process is NVIDIA doing differently than AMD that has been giving them a performance advantage in these last few years? The changes made on the hardware level going from GCN to RDNA have mostly to do with efficiency. There's a distinct lack of features for developers which is a bit disappointing, but some of the changes bring AMD's architecture very close to Nvidia's Pascal and especially to Turing. So there's a move to Wave 32 on a per clock cycle basis, which will help reduce stalls and keep the GPU busy. Again, this will improve efficiency, seeing as this is still a multiple of 16, there won't be any changes needed to the current shaders. So it's things like this that you consider as being legacy from GCN. There are efficiency-focused hardware changes, but they don't require developers to change code that was already optimized for GCN. There's also the new cache system, which seems like the most impressive and necessary change over GCN. Now, since we're seeing AMD comparing Navi to Vega instead of Polaris, you might assume that a reduction in compute units and an increase in clock speeds means that Navi is less focused on compute and more focused on gaming tasks. But that's not actually the case. In fact, most of the improvements seem to precisely be targeting better compute performance in Navi, to the point where the GPUs are getting a speed up despite the reduction in the number of cores. The 40 compute units in the full Navi 10 chip are also dual cores. At Computex, Lisa Su said that GCN and RDNA would co exist, and that RDNA is a gaming-focused architecture. That might very well be true, but looking at these new compute units and the caching system, to me, RDNA looks very much like it will make its way into data center accelerators. Having these dual compute units makes a lot of sense as the adjacent resources can be shared as needed. And we'll come back to this later in the video. With RDNA, there's better compute unit utilization and latency hiding. What that means is if a thread is waiting for a memory operation to complete, another thread can be executing arithmetic operations. Previously with GCN, some processing elements would be idling, waiting for operations to finish so that others could begin. So this is what you would call occupancy. So even though bandwidth is a constant, the sufficient use of resources in RDNA means that bandwidth becomes less of a bottleneck, which was one of the problems with the Vega cards. So far, the increase in parallel capability has been tied to the increase in resolution. More pixels to compute require more cores to compute them. This is why we're seeing AMD specifically target their whole 5700 series launch on consumers wanting to upgrade to 1440p, and why the 5700 XT is shown beating the RTX 2070 in 1440p gaming at maximum settings. So you can imagine what will happen when AMD makes a larger Navi GPU, with a larger die that will feature 
even more compute units and increased bandwidth, you can expect the 5800 XT and the 5900 XT especially to be incredible performers at 4K. I've asked AMD about new features that aren't mentioned in the presentation slides, but so far I haven't heard of any, at least at the time of making this video. Something that would be of interest would be hardware support for command buffer generation on the GPU, as that could allow for things like more objects on screen. In future videos, we will look at some of the trends that will be happening in game development in the coming years. So with the information from the first part of this video where we looked at the graphics pipeline, and now that we took a general view of the RDNA hardware, let's see how graphics in games are generated from the hardware perspective. So to begin with, we will assemble geometry from a 3D model. For instance, this bear. If we zoom closer, you'll see that, as we mentioned earlier, the bear model is made up of a bunch of vertices that are linked together to form primitives, like this triangle here. In hardware, this is an instruction that goes from the CPU to the graphics command processor over here. Next, the command processor tells the geometry processor and other hardware units to perform operations. It interprets the CPU commands like use this buffer, set this render state, use this shader program, draw this mesh made up of these vertices. So the command processor is in charge of taking all of these orders and assigning them to the various units in the GPU. <laughs> now pay attention. One thing to take notice is that to do operations on vertices, each vertex is executed in a single thread. So all those transformations that we looked at earlier in the video are executed in a massive parallel system, where the vertices are distributed through the compute units. That way, the transforms that we need are executed really quickly. This is the beauty of parallelization. So in RDNA, each of these compute units can execute 64 threads in parallel. A SIMD in RDNA is 32 wide, as we saw in those presentation slides. What SIMD means is single instruction, multiple data. In this case, the data would be a single vertex. So you can have a set of instructions in a single shader program that a graphics programmer made, and each of these instructions would be executed for 64 vertices in parallel. If this sounds confusing, don't worry. You'll see later why this change to AMD's architecture is relevant. Now how does the cache enter this whole process? The purpose of the cache system is to accelerate GPU memory access. So if you need to sample a texture from a shader program, the GPU checks L1 cache to see if the data is there. If not, it checks L2. And if it's not there, it reads the data from memory and stores it in cache so that the next time it needs it, it will be right there inside the chip and can be accessed much faster. The memory controller over here is what reads data from GDDR6. The way data is moved around can have an enormous impact on energy usage depending on how far the data has to move. And this is a significant change from the Vega GPUs, for instance. Moving data in local cache uses around 5 picojoules per word. Moving it to on-chip SRAM, like with HBM in the Vega cards uses around 50 picojoules per word. While if you have to move the data all the way to GDDR memory, which is what happens with the vast majority of GPUs, then around 640 picojoules per word are used. So when people say that the 5700 NXT have too high a TDP considering they are on 7 nanometers and the dies are quite small, you have to take into account that unlike with Vega, which had HBM2 memory right there next to the logic, now with the 5700 NXT, the data is going to be traveling much longer distances and using a magnitude more energy to do so. There's more to energy usage than this, of course, and we'll come back to that when we look at Turing in a second. Additional transforms will happen to vertices, like per vertex lighting. Now, because some of these transforms, depending on knowing what the results of previous transforms are, what used to happen in GCN was that the GPU would stall until it had all the values it needed. Now, with RDNA, it can start the process of doing per-vertex lighting asynchronously while some of the previous work on vertices is still being done. Again, this is AMD focusing on a more efficient use of the hardware in RDNA versus GCN. As a result, the compute capabilities of RDNA are greatly improved compared to GCN. The geometry shader state 
which follows a similar procedure, with commands going from the CPU to the GPU's graphics command processor, which then uses the GPU resources in an asynchronous way to compute the vertices efficiently and store them in memory. And lastly, the projection is calculated, again following this same pattern. Now that all the geometry has been worked on and stored in memory, it's time to turn that into the pixels that form an image, what's also known as rasterization. Rasterization is a fixed function process that is performed here in the rasterizers. So even though this is all a bit complicated and maybe hard to follow, you've hopefully caught on that there's a pattern to all this. Programs called shaders issue commands through the CPU that the GPU then executes one at a time but in a massively parallel system, resulting in a constant flow of vertices coming in and out, and then at this rasterization stage, pixels coming in and out. Once we have our raster image ready, we can operate on each individual pixel for things like texturing. You'll notice that inside the compute units, there are texture filter units and texture mapping units that will perform this work. After this whole process, we have a final image, which we put in what's called the frame buffer. The display engine, which is over here, then sends the final frame to the monitor. So when you hear a frames per second, that's how many times in a second this whole process is happening. So now that we understand how this whole process works, using the RDNA architecture to exemplify its flow, what has made NVIDIA GPUs generally faster at all of this in these last few years? The first problem with NVIDIA's architectures is that they are a black box in many regards. While AMD provides ample documentation for developers to optimize for their hardware, NVIDIA keeps much of its architecture under wraps. This is one of the reasons you will often hear developers say that they hate working with NVIDIA, and this leads to one of the myths that we should clarify. Most people will assume that because the vast majority of PC gamers have NVIDIA GPUs, that developers optimize their games primarily for NVIDIA hardware. This is a case of tunnel vision. The reality is that when games are optimized for PC, if at all, they are always optimized for GCN, for AMD hardware, because that's what developers are familiar with. The only exceptions are when there's a sponsorship deal between a developer and NVIDIA. As PC gamers, it's easy for us to have tunnel vision and forget that AMD actually has the vast majority of the graphics market. Between consoles, the cloud, PC, and now even mobile, Nvidia's presence really is mostly limited to the PC market. But if that's the case, then why does Nvidia hardware perform so well? Well, much of this performance advantage for Nvidia comes from better drivers. While AMD has roughly 10,000 employees, which are devoted to the CPU and GPU business, amongst other things, Nvidia has roughly 11,500 employees employees, most of which are devoted to just graphics in one form or another. Compared to AMD, Nvidia spends a lot more engineering resources in developing drivers that do the conversion from API to hardware, at least when it comes to DirectX 11. There's also of course the issue of GPU size. Nvidia has traditionally put out GPUs with very large dice. The 2080 Ti GPU, for instance, is a whopping 750 4 mm squared. That's a lot of cores and fixed function units that you can fit in there. In addition to drivers and die size, there are of course differences in IPC. But I suspect that there's more to just drivers and the number of transistors when it comes to Nvidia's performance lead. One interesting change from Pascal to Turing is that Turing is able to do integer and floating point calculations concurrently. Traditionally, integer calculations are done by the CPUs, so why I move them to the GPU. Nvidia took this path with Turing for two reasons. On the consumer side, there are things like ray tracing that need integer calculations and floating point happening concurrently. And in deep learning, integer will help accelerate inference workloads. You see, as graphics workloads in games get more complicated over time, integer processing will become more important. For example, instead of processing just one vertex per 
thread, as we saw earlier. With integer, you could process one object per thread. RDNA also addresses this trend by having one cycle issue for integer operations. And just like we saw with RDNA now having those dual compute units, in Turing, the TPCs now have two SMs, which have 64 CUDA cores each. So you might be starting to notice something here. AMD and NVIDIA analyze the software that runs on their processors, then they try to optimize for it. But they also try to find ways to enable developers to write more efficient software. Turing and RDNA are converging architectures. Both are responding in very similar ways to what developers are asking for. And both are looking at the future of graphics and providing the hardware solutions to meet them. And I believe the future will heavily favor AMD in this regard. In DX11, NVIDIA implemented all sorts of techniques to achieve extra performance. Things like heavily compressing textures or encoding local data so it didn't have to go to SRAM but stayed in cache. Last year, Brian from Tekia City did a video comparing image quality between AMD GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs and concluded that NVIDIA GPUs had lower image quality. Not something that you might necessarily notice in day-to-day -day usage, but it was observable. NVIDIA employs these and many other techniques on a hardware level, and that's one of the main factors that gives them an advantage. Because much of NVIDIA's hardware is a black box, developers don't even know that these things are happening and have no control over them. If you follow NVIDIA's talks on deep learning, you will see that they proudly talk about how they are using similar techniques for achieving extra performance in inference workloads, just like they have been doing in gaming for many years. Mind you, I'm not saying that these techniques are wrong. What I am saying is that they are part of NVIDIA's philosophical approach to designing hardware, like for instance, reducing the energy overhead in every possible instance, with little loss to detail or accuracy in most cases. So they will find ways to squeeze out performance by reducing energy usage and managing the size of data that is processed in the hardware. So in the same game, AMD's hardware is processing a lot more data and using more energy to get the same things done as NVIDIA. So NVIDIA pulls ahead and AMD has been playing catch up. But that's all about to change. Beginning in 2012, AMD started making a push for low-level APIs, first with Mantle, which later became Vulkan, and later with DX12. The idea here being to give developers better access to the hardware, so that the drivers don't play as much of a role in interpreting the API commands. By 2016, AMD was pushing developer support for asynchronous compute, in an effort to lay the ground for what will be the future of graphics programming in many aspects of gaming workloads. These are two massive changes to the way games are made, and changes like this take a long time. But 2019 represents an inflection point when it comes to performance leadership in GPUs. With the next generation of consoles on the horizon, with both AMD CPU and GPU next generation technology in them, which leverage low-level APIs in asynchronous compute better than ever, Ever, we will start to see a massive shift in the games industry towards these processes. Stadia will also push Vulkan, and all of this will have repercussions in PC gaming. As we just saw, RDNA and Turing are very similar architectures, but AMD has most, if not all, of the developer community optimizing for their hardware. This will be a huge advantage for them now that DX11 will begin being phased out. Lisa who has indicated that RDNA is scalable from smartphones to high-end GPUs, and she has also said that the company is committed to delivering leadership performance at every price point. That's right, every price point. What that means is that you can expect to see a Navi 5800 and 5800 XT on the market before the end of this year. In the coming months, as the profits from the new Ryzen chips start to materialize, 
price, AMD will start releasing more Navi GPUs, both smaller than the 5700 as expected, but also larger than the 5700 XT. And in January, at CES, we will probably start hearing about the 5900 and 5900 XT, the latter of which will very likely take back the performance crown in PC gaming. What most people seem to be missing is that the Navi GPUs are AMD's Zen moment for Radeon. The bet that AMD took with Mantle and the consoles first, then through Async Compute and DX12 more recently, and now with this streamlined RDNA architecture that addresses many of the problems that GCN had, will take the company in 2020 to a leadership position in PC graphics performance. Let's see how Nvidia responds. As YouTube revenue continues to shrink down to the point of being almost non-existent, the Cortex patron support is what allows this channel and videos like today's to exist. So a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. Consider joining them for just one dollar per month and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where you can talk to me and other like-minded tech enthusiasts. If you can't contribute financially at this time, then please share this video on social media as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.